Well, here we go right now. So uh, in the words of Dashboard Confessional, so long, sweet summer, right? Or some of you is wondering, who's Dashboard Confessional? Those of you who are wondering who Dashboard Confessional is will remember the doors, right? You'll know the doors when they sing, summer's almost over. It's gone, right? Summer's gone. And I know that so many people in our world, just absolutely, including many of you, hate it when summer's over. Man, we live for summer. We love the summer, and man, we love the beach, and I, I know that. That's why so many songs have been written about the end of summer and endless summer and all these things, and people just hate it when summer's over. I'm not one of those people, okay? I absolutely love when summer is over for multiple reasons. I mean, one, I'm not a hot weather guy at all. I mean, man, I'm hot natured. I love cooler weather, right? I, I love cooler weather. I'm not a hot weather guy. Uh, I, I, I would much prefer boots to flip-flops and, and fire pits to sweaty armpits. I mean, I, 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 I'm not a summer guy. I also love it when summer ends because that means the glorious football season's about to begin, right? I mean, I love that. That's awesome. But one of the reasons, and the most, uh, I guess, the, the, the reason I love it more than anything is because it's really a time, at, being a pastor for all these years, is a time when people sort of re-engage, right? It's easy to get distracted in the summer. It's easy, you've got, you're pulled in so many different directions, man. You've got vacations, I hope you had vacation. I hope you traveled, I hope you had a good time. But it's, there's so much going on, people coming to you, you going to people, it's easy to get distracted. And summer's a time when people just get back in the groove, typically. You get back in the groove, that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna get back in the groove in our series in Revelation called The Reigning King. Now, anytime you do a sermon series, it's hard to take a break, especially here because we preach through books of the Bible. That's how we uh, do it here. We preach verse by verse uh, through books of the Bible, and when you're preaching through a book of the Bible, what happens is you begin to understand the context. You begin to understand if it's a book that Paul wrote or Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or, or Moses wrote it. Whoever wrote it, you begin to understand the study in the book. You know the context, who he's writing to, how it's building, what he said in the previous chapter, why he's saying this based on what he said already, all those things, and then you take a break. And then when you start back, uh, you know, you lose some momentum when you take that break and you start back and it's sort of like kids in school. They take a summer break and then you start back up. You gotta have a ramp up time to reteach some things, right? And so that's what we wanna do today because every book is hard to take a break, but especially the book of Revelation because it's so mysterious, right? And so today I wanna do a little review just to bring you up to speed, to help you to understand some rules that will help you to understand the rest of this book as we're gonna go through, Lord willing, the rest of this book through chapter 22, <clears throat> from now through the fall, okay? And so if you're new to us, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the entire sermon series because listen, people are afraid of this book. Uh, I'm gonna be honest, this is the first time I've preached through this book in my entire ministry career in 30 years and it's not like a book preachers go, oh, I just want to preach Revelation because it's a mysterious book. I mean, I know people wanna hear it because it's mysterious. Preachers don't wanna preach it because it's mysterious, but it's scary. I mean, man, we look at the, the images in here and you've got blood and you've got destruction and you've got beasts and all this stuff. It's like, whoa, that's a scary book. But hopefully, well, I want you to go back and read it. And what, I'm, what we're preaching for right now is you begin to understand, it's not scary, it's hopeful. We begin to understand what this book's about and it's like, it brings great hope, especially in the day in which we're living. So let me do a little review, give you some rules uh, for interpreting this book so you'll grasp it as we go through the rest of it. First off, remember, Revelation is apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature, which means it's full of images and symbols. We're not versed in apocalyptic literature much in our world. There's only a couple of books in the Bible, a few books in the Bible that are apocalyptic. Uh, Revelation, Daniel, it's apocalyptic. It's full of symbols and it's full of images. And, and, and that's why we've seen things like golden lampstands. Remember, golden lampstands and stars and beasts and dragons and horses. A glassy sea surrounds God on his throne. Eyes like flaming uh, fire. It's like, what does all of this stuff mean? Good night. That's why it's confusing. It's mysterious. It's what do we do with it, right? But in the first century world, they would not have been as intimidated or as confused with it because they were well versed in apocalyptic literature. They knew that it was full of symbols and images that were very rarely, if ever, meant to be taken literally, which is a common mistake made uh, among people who preach Revelation and people who study it and people who teach it, is this, this deal about taking all these things literally or trying to make them literal when we can. 
And that's what happens, and it brings some confusion. Let me give you some examples. Those who take a more literal approach to it uh, are, you know, would be much more of like a dispensationalist or a futurist. And now you say, okay, who is dispensationalist? Most of you are probably in that camp, to be quite honest, because that is the mindset that we've come from in, in, in our world based on, to be quite honest with you, not necessarily a biblical teaching, but the teaching of Tim LaHaye and, and, and the Left Behind series, because that is a dispensationalist sensational or a futurist view of revelation, okay? And, 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 and that's okay if you are. It's like I've said, this is not your eschatology about when that, it's not a, it's not a first tier uh, doctrine. It's like, okay, are you premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, you pre-trib, all that. That, that. It's okay for us to have different thoughts on that. Uh, I've tried to say that from the beginning. That's not, necess- that's not my thoughts on revelation. It once was, to be quite honest, and to be quite honest, it was shaped more from uh, left behind things like that than the Bible, to be quite honest, okay? Okay? So I'm, I'm just trying to set you at ease. I'm not trying to say you got, you got to come to where I am. I'm just trying to say I want to present this and hopefully it will help you progress through this book. But those who are futurists or dispensationalists, uh, when, 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 when they begin to, 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 to look at this and they have a tendency to flip-flop back and forth between symbolic and literal, depending on what fits the narrative that they're trying to sell, to be quite honest, okay? They also believe that Revelation is that's why they're called futurists because they believe that basically from chapter four on is all about the future. And it's, it's like, well, tomorrow's the future, but tomorrow it's about the future. Next year it's about, in other words, it's only about the, 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 the few years immediately prior to Jesus's return, which is sad and confusing because what that means is John wrote this book. He wrote down a vision given to him by Jesus and it would not apply to any Christian except the Christians that live in that time immediately prior to Christ's return. That means to all the, to the church that John wrote this to, the churches that John wrote this to, that we, we the lampstands, that, you know, all the stuff that we learned in the first few chapters, it would have meant nothing except knowledge. It would have been a knowledge, okay, that's fine, but it would have not been applicable to any of those because those Christians we now know didn't live in the last days. Your granddaddy didn't live in the last days. If you know, if he died, the last generation didn't live in the last days, according to that view. And so, so it means it's all future, and it would have no meaning for or application, I should say, for those of us who do not live in the last days, right? And let me let me give you an example of how it brings a lot of confusion. Let's take the Antichrist for example. Antichrist is a character. Right? It's one of the characters that scares people and all that kind of stuff in the book of Revelation. Well, those who with a futurist dispensational view believe that the Antichrist is a man who is full of all kinds of evil in the years immediately prior to Christ's return. Okay? Now, do I believe that will happen? Yes, I believe that's true, but I don't believe it's just limited to that. Let me tell you how that's confusing when that's your view. Because what, what happens is, as we all know, that then we look at men who are all kinds of evil and proclaim, oh, that's the Antichrist, right? And we know that the Antichrist has been everybody for years. It's been everybody from the Pope to Adolf Hitler to Saddam Hussein. Uh, to uh, Donald Trump, to now Joe Biden. I mean, the Catholics won't even give him communion now hardly, so we know he's the Antichrist, right? I mean, uh, it, it's been, if you're a Democratic Christian, uh, whoever, if, and there's a Republican president, he's the Antichrist. If you're a Republican Christian and there's a Democratic cr- uh, president, that's the Antichrist, right? I mean, that's just sort of how it's been for years. And then what happens when that person dies, Jesus didn't return, it's like, oh, well, don't guess that was the Antichrist. So we look at the Middle East and we, we try to interpret through the Middle East and well, who's the evil man alive today? That's the Antichrist. We reinterpret it every few years, and, and that's, that's sort of sad. That's sort of confusing. Now, do I believe that there will be a man who is all, sort of full of all sorts of evil right before, before Christ's return? I do, but I don't believe it's limited to that. I believe John clearly teaches that, that there's an Antichrist in every generation. I believe that Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. I believe that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. I believe that there's many men and many people who are the Antichrist and have been in every generation because I do not believe that the end times are limited to just a few years before Jesus returns. I believe the Bible is really clear that the end times began with Jesus' ascension after his death and resurrection, and the end times go until Jesus' return. We've been living in the end times for over 2,000 years, and we're living in the end times now. There are antichrists now. This book applies to us now. I believe we're living in the tribulation right now, and, and that this book applies to us right now in an amazing way, and he wrote it. Therefore, John didn't write it 
to be like Nostradamus. In other words, it wasn't to predict the future. John did not write this vision as a code book to give us a code book so that we could use it to decipher when Jesus will return and uh, who the Antichrist is. I don't believe that's why John gave us this book. He gave us this, wrote this vision down to help us, not as a code book, but as a picture book that, that, that God gives us a picture. He, he takes back the curtains and lets us have a behind the scenes look at the battle that's raging the spiritual battle, not a flesh and blood, a battle not fought with cannons and planes and, and, and bullets, but a, cannon, a battle that's fought with prayer. It's a spiritual battle and the spiritual armor. It's a spiritual battle taking place. And we all know that sometimes the enemy, the dragon, appears to be winning this battle. It, it appears like in America today, the church has lost major influence, right? I mean, we can look at the church. Just a few years ago, man, the church was respected. Pastors were respected. The, 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 the culture, the country appreciated Christian moral values. Today, pastors and churches are the most suspected people, and Christian moral values are deemed, you know, old fashioned, out of date, archaic, and even hate, right? And so we've lost momentum, we've lost, uh, you know, influence, and we look and we say, man, it looks like the, the enemy's winning. And uh, what we need to understand is this is what Revelation is all about. Revelation says, hey, it might look like that sometimes, and it's going to, but you need to understand that not only is he losing, he has lost, that Jesus is ruling and reigning right now. He's not going to just be the reigning king when he comes back. He is the reigning king ruling right now on the throne. All hail King Jesus, right? That's what Revelation is all about. It's about all hail King Jesus. Now, now we have seen uh, already two sets of seven judgments. We saw the seven seal judgments, the seven uh, trumpet judgments, and we're going to see the seven bowl judgments in just a few weeks, right? Now, futurist dispensationalists will think that, okay, those are 21 judgments. You got seven seal, seven trumpets, seven bowl, 21 judgments in succession. I do not believe that's, that's, that's what this is. I think that he's talking about seven judgments and he gives us uh, three sets because, and what they are is they're not happening in succession. They're the same judgments, and he telling, he's, he's telling them, uh, revealing them to us from different angles. It's like watching a football game. It's called recapitulation, recap, right? In other words, it's like watching a football game, man. When you watch a football game and you've got the play view, the sideline view, then you've got the overhead view, you've got the zoomed in on the lineman so you can see him holding. You've got all these views that change your perspective, that give you a different perspective. That's what these judgments are, the, the, the seal judgments. And then you notice that the trumpet judgments are very similar to the seal judgments. And then the bowl judgments are gonna be very similar to those. Why? Because they're the same judgments and they're giving us different angles. But here's what we know. They get much more intense with each set of seven. If they're getting more severe, which absolutely lets us know what's going on in our world, doesn't it? Does that, any of that ring a bell? Do you think things are getting more severe in our world? I mean, for goodness sake, you know, Travis and some of us were talking about that. It, man, it snowed in Brazil last year, did you, uh, last week. Did you know that? I mean, man, you had hail falling the size of golf balls in Italy. You got wildfires ravaging, not just California, but the world. The towns are destroyed. Man, you've got people at division all over the world. I mean, it's just literally chaotic, right, in our world right now. And so it begins to help you make sense of, of what's going on in our world. Now, before he jumps into the bold judgments, after the trumpet judgments, he introduces us to seven events. He introduces us to seven characters, seven. Seven's an important number in Revelation, right? But he introduces us to some characters, and uh, in chapters 12 and 13 and 14, he begins to introduce us some characters. And remember, a few of those characters are the woman, the child, and the dragon. Now, who are the woman, the child, and the dragon? Well, obviously, symbolic, not literal. Who's the woman? The woman's the people of God. Remember, he comes after the woman, right? He comes after the woman, and, and, uh, and, and the child is the, the Messiah, and then the, 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 the dragon is the Satan, the enemy, whose mission is to eradicate the, the child of the woman. Why? It goes back to Genesis chapter three. Remember what happened in Genesis three. Genesis three, Adam and Eve fell. 
Genesis 1 and 2, God created the world. It was perfect. It was beautiful. There was absolutely harmony in everything. No pain, no disease, no murder, no, 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 no racism, no, no, no uh, rebellious children, no more month than money. There was none of that stuff, right? It was beautiful. At Genesis 3, they fell, broke the world. God comes and holds them accountable when he pronounces judgment. Remember, he pronounced judgment on the serpent. And what did he say? He told the serpent that the seed of the woman, it's called the first gospel, the proto-evangelium, the seed of the woman will destroy you. You're gonna wound him, but he's going to destroy you. Remember Genesis three. So what happened? From that moment on, what did the enemy, what was his mission? To destroy and eradicate the seed of the woman. Who was what? The Messiah, the woman in Genesis, the woman in Revelation, the seed of the woman, the child in Revelation. His mission was to destroy the seed of the woman because he knew that the seed, the Messiah, would destroy him. So that's his mission all through the rest of the Bible. That's what, that's what the killing of all of the babies in Exodus is all about. You remember Moses and when all the babies were being killed and Moses' his mother was bold enough to protect her child and put him in the river and he becomes, uh, the, the Pharaoh's daughter finds him. That's what that's all about. That's what Herod killing all the babies in Bethlehem, two years and younger. You remember the Magi show up uh, and Herod says, oh, I wanna worship the king. They, they, God tells him to leave another way. He calls in uh, you know, all the, the, the seminary professors, the free, all this stuff. He says, where's this king to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem the Messiah, the seed. So what did Herod do? Herod uh, was recruited by the enemy, the dragon, and he killed, tried to, he killed all the babies in Bethlehem. What was that for? It was to try to eradicate the seed of the woman. You remember the story of Esther? The story of Esther is the enemy trying to eradicate the seed of the woman. It's all through history, all through the Bible, but what happened? The enemy did not succeed. He was utterly defeated with the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. He was defeated once for all, and he was thrown at that moment out of heaven. Now, you say, hold on a minute. You're telling me that Satan, the dragon, was in heaven? No, no, no. He didn't reside there. We go back in Isaiah, and we see where, you know, he was thrown out of heaven. That's not this. It's not that he didn't reside. He doesn't reside in heaven, but we do know that before the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, that the dragon went before the throne of God to accuse God's people. Remember the book of Job. That's what the book of Job is all about. He goes before the throne, he accuses God's people, and, and, and that's what he did. But after the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ, he can now no longer bring any accusation against God's people. As Paul said in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. You cannot be condemned if you're a believer. You are covered in the blood of Jesus. You are righteous, you are free, you are redeemed. You cannot be confused, so he's, he's cast away from God, can never go before his presence to accuse you any longer. Okay? Now, but he's come up with a much more clever scheme. He's come up with a much more clever scheme. You see, the dragon can no longer go before the Father to accuse you. So what's he do? Well, he gets you to accuse you. Right? I'm no good. God doesn't love me. Look at what I did. God can't use me. Look at what I've done. See, he can't accuse you any longer, so he gets you to accuse you, and you need to understand there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. You need to understand grace, and you need to understand mercy. And you need to understand God, and you'll live much differently. And so, so the dragon's thrown out of heaven, and he cannot any longer uh, go before God to accuse you, and he is awaiting his final destruction. And in that time, he is full of rage, and he mounts another attack on the woman's offspring, which is who? The church. And how does he do that? He enlists the beast and the false prophet to promote lies and deception that will destroy the church and keep people from becoming a part of the church. My goodness, is he describing our world today? Do you see lies in our world today? Do you see deception in our world today? Do you see division in our world today? Do you see confusion in our world today? Do you see that within churches today? Man, do you see that within false teachers today, whether they're Christian or whether they're, 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 they're uh, uh, you know, uh, agnostic? It do you see confusion and lies and deception? It's all over our world. You're beginning to see this. Hopefully, it will help you understand our world and make sense of our world and also have hope because he's the reigning king. And so this beast that he enlists, if you'll remember, he's got, man, he's a hideous looking creature, isn't he? I mean, he's got seven heads and 10 horns and it's like, see, that's what starts getting scary. That's what stuff makes you lie down at night and close your eyes and go, oh gosh, I'm gonna have a nightmare. I mean, I, I don't know if I wanna read Revelation. 
got seven heads and ten horned beasts. What's that all about? I mean, you know, if you're a futurist, if you're, a, I mean, it could be literal. Oh, my goodness, this seven-headed dragon-type-looking beast. It's like, well, that's not what it is at all. It's symbolic. What's it a symbol of? Seven heads. What's seven? Seven is completion, perfect in the Bible, right? Ten horns. What's ten? Well, what's horns? Well, horns are power. And so what this is, it's a symbol of complete power. And what's it a symbol of? It's not a hideous seven-headed dragon-looking monster. It's talking about evil empires, and evil emperors and kings and rulers and people that will that hate God and will, that will mount an attack upon his people and try to eradicate the influence of the gospel. And this beast had a fatal wound, but he he come back to life. Now what's that all about? I mean Wow, it's a beast. He come back to life. It's like miraculous power. What is this? And see, everything Jesus does, the enemy tries to mimic, right? He tries to mimic and give you a false uh, of everything that the enemy does. Jesus, we, when we see God, we've got the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But you've got the Trinity with, with, with the dragon. You've got the, the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. You got Jesus coming back from the dead, the resurrection. You've got the enemy that tries to mimic this. And it's not that the, there was a dragon and somebody cut one of the two of the heads off of the dragon and he was about to die. That's a dragon slayer. That's not what it was. He's talking about every time an evil empire rises, an evil emperor rises. And they begin to malign God's people because they attack God's people because they hate Christ and they hate his pride and they hate the church. And, and eventually they will die themselves. And you think, just like Rome, every world power, folks, in history, take Rome. When John wrote this, Rome was the world power. John wrote this, Rome was the world power. Nero was an emperor, and Nero uh, had, had, had come in, and he was killing Christians. He was making uh, the culture worship him, and if you didn't worship him, then you couldn't have a job, you couldn't have your guild card, you couldn't work, your father was arrested, your mother was killed, uh, your children were killed, and then all of a sudden Nero dies, and you think, praise the Lord, he's gone. What he's saying here, John is saying, every time one falls, another will rise and take its place. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Another will rise and take its place, and there will be this battle until Jesus returns. Christians will be persecuted. Christians will be maligned. God is hated. God's church is hated, and this is the world in which we live. Now, he says that the, the, the beast will force uh, people to take the mark of the beast, right? I mean, everybody's, everybody, uh, uh, young and old, rich and poor, going to take the mark of the beast. Now, that's a scary thing, the mark of the beast. I mean, man, it's a scary thing. And again, let's go to those who take that literally. Those who take that literally have said that the mark of the beast, what is the mark of the beast? I mean, they take it literally. It's going to literally happen. What's the mark of the beast? Well, it's, it's been credit cards. Man, it's been microchips. It's been your smartphone, your cell phone. It's been taking your temperature on the front of your head. It, it, it's been, uh, you know what it is today? Every day I read this and people pleading with, you got, you got, you know, again, you got people on Facebook, which is absolutely, folks, one of the, you, let me tell you, this is just a side opinion. One of the greatest things you can do in your life is to get off of Facebook, just to be quite honest, social media. That's just a side opinion. Uh, but, uh, you know, everybody gets on there and, and every day, you know what I, what, what I see, whether it's on the news, People's like, that, that, that vaccine, that's the mark of the beast. That's what it is. And, I, and all these people, and typically they're futurists and, and, and dispensationists, they believe that everything's the mark of the beast and the mark of the beast is literal. But what's, what's almost comical about it is the mark of the beast is literal to those people. But you know what? The Bible also says that there's a mark of the lamb on your forehead. We're gonna read it in just a moment. That those who belong to Jesus have a mark on their forehead. Oh, but that's not literal. The mark of the beast is literal, but that's not literal. Why is it not? Well, I don't have one. I mean, that could be the only reason, right? I don't have one. I mean, I would love, I mean, the, the world is divided into two groups of people and only two, those who follow Jesus and those who hate Jesus, those who are redeemed and those who are not, those who have the mark of the beast and those who have the mark of the lamb. 
Only two groups of people, and you are in one of the two groups. There is no in-between. You see, that's our confusion. Our confusion is, man, those who love God, Billy Graham, man, my grandmama, people like that. Man, those who hate God, Adolf Hitler, Saddam Hussein, all those people. But man, these people right here, surely there's a third group because they're pretty good people. Here's what Jesus said. You're for me or you're against me, right? There are two groups of people. you are either got the mark of the lamb or you've got the mark of the beast. You are either devoted to God or you are devoted to Satan. One of those two. There is no option. There is no third option, okay? And you know what I would love? Wouldn't it be so awesome if we could just look, if I could look at you and I could see, man, you've got the, everybody's got a mark on their forehead. If one's literal, they both got to be literal. And everybody's got to, you're either mark, you've got the mark of the beast or you've got the mark of the lamb. You're a Christian, you're not a Christian. Wouldn't that be awesome? Because then I could go along and I could see everybody's not Christians and I could say, man, we need to share the gospel with you. Not so I could say we need, we need to team up against you. We need to come, we need to love you. We need to share the gospel with you. And so that I could tell all of you, you got a mark on your forehead saying I'm a mark of the lamb. So I come to you and say, hey man, straighten up and act like it, right? <laughs> not in that context, like oh, I don't want to mark like that then. <laughs> Listen, we, we, everybody, I wish everybody had a mark on their head, but they don't. I don't and you don't, right? Because why? It's not literal, the mark of the beast is not literal. And my, the way I view, just like the mark of the lamb's not literal, what is it? It's a reference. And that day, here's what happened. Slaves were tattooed and marked on their forehead. So were soldiers. Slaves were tattooed and marked to say, this is my owner. This is who owns me. Soldiers were tattooed and marked to say, this is the general who has my devotion. I am devoted and I am owned by this person. That's what the mark on the forehead was all about. So it's a symbolic way of saying there is, you are either marked, you are owned and you're devoted to, to Jesus, or you are owned and you are devoted to Satan. One of those two things. There is no third thing. You're owned. And it goes back to an Isaiah 49. And I, I, I think it's Isaiah 49, where it says that God has engraven you on the palm of his hand. If you're a believer, God has engraven you on the palm of his hand. Now, do I believe that God forgets my name and he had to engrave my name, Pat Hood? Yeah, oh, Pat's one of mine, yep. No, what's it saying? God owns me. I belong to Jesus. What blessed me, you know, I belong to Jesus. What a great song, because it's not that Jesus belongs to me, right? I belong to him because he owns me. He bought me with his blood. He owns me. And then what does it say in the New Testament? It says that I am in the palm of his hand and nothing can take me out of his hand. He owns me and my salvation is secure within him because it's all him. All hell, King Jesus, right? So, so with all of that, now we can start the sermon. That's, that's a little... That's a little more review than I meant to go, but I hadn't preached in a while, so I'm gonna blame it on Travis, though. So I always blame it on the worship pastor. So let's dive in. With that review, let's dive in. And I've got a three-point message, and I'm gonna try to be really quick with them, all right? I'm gonna try. Okay, let's, let's read verses one through three of chapter 14. Then I look, John's getting another vision. John is, is seeing another vision here. Then I look and behold on Mount Zion. Now, I circle that if you've got a, a, a real copy Bible. Highlight it if you've got an electronic, whatever. Mount Zion, what's that? On Mount Zion stood the lamb. Now, we know who the lamb is. The lamb is Jesus, right? The lamb is Jesus. On Mount Zion stood the lamb and with 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. There we go. I mean, if there's a mark of the beast, there's gotta be a mark of the lamb, right? That's literal, okay? And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. All right, now let me stop, and I'm gonna give you two points right here, and we're gonna finish out with a third, all right? The first point here is this. Remember, Revelation is all about hope. It's not to scare you. It's to give you hope to stay in the battle. So what's the first point we see here in Revelation 14? We see that the, God's people have the hope of heaven. 
We have the hope of heaven. That's exactly what this entire sermon's about because all of this is from heaven. And here's what God's people have the hope of heaven. Now look at what happens. John sees this vision. After I brought you up, John sees this vision. What's he see? He sees Jesus standing on Mount Zion with 144,000 believers. So the lamb is Jesus. Mount Zion is, where is Mount Zion today? Well, Mount Zion is heaven, folks. If we look at, at, at scripture in the Old Testament, Mount Zion is a symbol of heaven. Go to Hebrews, Mount Zion is a symbol of heaven. So you have Jesus, and he, now he's in heaven, and he's got 144,000 with him, and you gotta stop, hit the brakes, and go, oh, 144,000 is all that's in heaven? What in the world is that about? You gotta stop and think about that, don't you, at least. So what is that? Well, there's some denominations that believe that there's literally only going to be 144,000 people in heaven, and it's only their denomination. And although there's maybe a couple of million in that denomination today and throughout the years, there have been several million, every one of those people in that denomination will say there's only 144,000 there, and guess what? I'm one of them, <laughs> right? Is that what that means? Thank the Lord, no. I mean, man, I'm just gonna tell you, if there's only 144,000 people in heaven, and it's, that would mean it's for pro-Christians, and listen, I wouldn't make the cut. I'd be cut from the roster because I'll promise you, there is a lot more than 144,000 that's a much better Christian than I am, if that's what it boils down to. If you go back, I mean, like, thank the Lord, it's, this is not about an elite pro-Christian that's in heaven. That's not what this is. Well, literalists or futurists or, or dispensationalists say this is the number of Jews that give, the ethnic Jews that give their heart to Christ during uh, the tribulation. Is that correct? I mean, man, I, no, you know, it's not, it's not literal, it's symbolic once again. What is 144,000? 144,000 is a number that represents the totality of God's church, his people, okay? There's, there is a uh, there's the church is the local church and then what's called the universal church, the visible and the invisible. The local visible church is each local expression. Life Point Church is a local church. And God in his word says that we should be a not just a part, but a member of a local church. See, one of the confusion today of the beasts and the false prophets, ah, oh, the church, you don't have to be a member of the church. What's membership all about? You know, it's the same thing, isn't it? Oh, you don't have to be married. What's marriage all about? I mean, we can just live together. We can just be together, but we're not committed to each other, really. I mean, no, you see, I, let me tell you who I'm responsible for. I'm responsible for the flock who is under my care. Who is under my care? Every pastor of every local assembly of every congregation is responsible for the people who are members of their church, not responsible for Christians who are not members of our church. You're not a member. This is not where you've placed your allegiance, your devotion. I'm in as long as it's good. I'm out when it's good. Man, I'll go to this church for a while. I'll go to that church for a while. It's like flitting, flirting back and forth. And man, it's, it's, it's just, that is not what the Bible teaches. You should be a member of a local church. That's life point. You've got, you've got you know, uh, other local churches. The universal in, uh, invisible church is the people who are Christians from all over the world. I just, I just uh, remember a minute ago, I, well, I said Flint, and I meant to say like, floor, and I, it, it, sound, it didn't sound right. <laughs> just remember, that's my, that's my, uh, my, my, my slurring coming on, but it, 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 it was funny, I thought, but anyway. I thought it was funny, but I, that's not what I meant to say, but anyway. So the invisible church, the invisible universal church is what? It's all of God's people all of God's people, from Moses all the way through, I mean, not from Moses, all of God's people, all through the scripture, it's all of God's people. If you're a Christian, you're part of this universal church that comes down to a, to a local assembly. Now, the universal church is the 144,000. It's all of God's people. So how do you, why, why is 144,000 a symbol of the local church? 144,000 is a symbol because it's the 12 tribes of Israel times the 12 disciples 
times a thousand. Well, how do you get it? 12, 12 times 12 times a thousand. 12 tribes, 12 disciples times a thousand. A thousand was an infinite number for them in that day. Today, for us, it'd be like gazillions, right? But a thousand, it's where you get the thousand year millennial reign, all that kind of stuff. So 12 times 12 times a thousand is 144,000. And so what this is a, re- a symbol of, it's a symbol of Jesus the Lamb on Mount Zion in heaven with all of his people. So what is he doing here? John's vision is to give us hope. It's to give us hope in the midst of the battle because sometimes the battle seems to be out of control and sometimes it looks like the enemy is winning. And when it looks like the enemy is winning, because in that day, remember, they couldn't buy, they couldn't sell. If you didn't bow to to, to the emperor, you didn't get a guild card, you couldn't work. You were being killed, ran out of town. Man, you were thrown in jail, put in stocks. I mean, man, it was a hard, hard thing. And so today, in America, Americans don't necessarily understand all that because we've had this privilege of shelter for the last 200 and some years. We've had this privilege of shelter, but that's going away, and we're seeing it all over the world. And in what it is, it, it, when it looks like the enemy's winning, you stay in a battle because he has already been defeated because he's given us the hope of heaven. Look at where you're going to be and hang in because this world you will receive Man, you will be maligned and you will be beaten, but this world is not your home. The hope of heaven is what you live for. And he sees, and he sees, and here's what he sees. He sees heaven is, is full of God's people, right? It's full, and it's not just a future prophecy. It's going on right now. Sure, when this is all said and done, we're going to be in heaven, We're not going to be maligned anymore. We're not going to be beaten. We're not going to be lied about. We're not going to lose a job. We're going to be in heaven, and it's going to be beautiful. It's not going to be broken. It's going to be perfect, and we're going to be there. But guess what? It's not just so that we can think about it when we die. It's right now because you know what? Every person in this room has lost a loved one. Every person in this room has, has had a mom, a dad, a child, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, a dear friend who loved Jesus who's died. And where are they right now? Man, they are not laying in the ground somewhere, soul sleeping. They are on Mount Zion with Jesus Christ, worshiping him. That's the hope that we have because we have hope in heaven because Jesus is reigning and he's ruling and he is the king of all. Okay, that's what we have. Stay in the battle. Have hope. It looks like it's it looks like it's absolutely messed up. Have hope. The hope of heaven. Now also notice this. How many are there? 144,000, 12 times 12 times 1,000. How many are there not? There's not 120,000. There's not 130,000, and there's not 143,999. There's 144,000, which means what? It means that not one true believer is lost. Not one. If you truly believe in Jesus, you will persevere to the end. You will make it if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ. Not one is lost. Man, that talks again about the security of those who love the Lord. The security of those who are marked by the Lamb. And folks, this is awesome because Our world, man, it can seem hopeless, and man, it can seem helpless, and it can seem impossible. There is no way that just a few people can literally overcome the momentum that's against us right now. It's impossible, right? I mean, the way things are going, it's impossible. It can be impossible in our world to think about, look at the way Christians are lying around. It's impossible. But here's what we know. He gives us He gives us this vision to let us know it's not only possible, it's a reality. And folks, you need to remember this and have hope because sometimes in your marriage, it seems impossible. My marriage can't make it. My marriage can't make it, but I promise if it's submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ because every issue, folks, is a spiritual issue, okay? Every problem is a spiritual problem somewhere in the line. And if it's submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, your marriage can seem impossible, but we have the hope because Jesus is reigning right now. Your marriage has hope. Your rebellious child might seem impossible, but because Jesus is reigning, there's hope. Your finances might seem impossible, but because Jesus is reigning and ruling, there's hope. You might not think you can ever forgive somebody and that relationship can be restored, but because Jesus is reigning and ruling, there is hope. God's people have the hope of heaven in a broken, crazy, out of control world, folks. That's what this book is all about. A crazy, out of control world where we have hope. 
because Jesus is reigning and ruling right now. Now, God's people not only have hope of heaven, God's people, what we see, are happy in heaven. God's people are happy in heaven. Now, notice, John heard what sounded like the roar of mighty waters and the clapping of thunder, and man, it was loud. And what was it, okay? It was God's people on Mount Zion, and what were they doing? They were singing a new song. They were singing a new song that no one else could learn. Now, let me, let me help you to understand something. This gives us a picture of heaven, and here, there, there's a whole lot of thoughts about heaven that are myths, okay? A whole lot of thoughts about hell that are myths. A whole lot of thoughts about heaven that are myths. Uh, 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 myth. Uh, sorry, I can't enunciate all of my words. Uh, there are myths, uh, and so, about heaven. And so, uh, in, in heaven, uh, some people think, man, we're just floating around on clouds and it's just like, oh man, we're charming angels or something. And, you know, uh, heaven's not this ethereal place, praise the Lord, right? I mean, you don't have wings because you do not become an angel when you die. I want you to get that. Don't hear, oh, heaven gained an angel today. <laughs> no, that's not true. I mean, it's cute, but it's not true, right? You don't become an angel when you die. Angels are created beings. And so, so, uh, you know, there's all these myths about heaven. So another myth about heaven is that heaven's this perpetual worship service. It's all we do in heaven is sing. And for some of you, you know, you're like, I mean, Travis is like, hey, let's go, right? Some of you is like, uh, don't sound like heaven to me. Well, heaven is not a perpetual worship service, folks. It's not. Okay, will we worship in heaven? Oh, yes, Jesus is there. He's the son. I mean, man, we're in his, we'll, yes. Is it a perpetual work? No, heaven is not this ethereal place. Heaven, we'll talk about this later. Heaven, this is heaven, folks. I want you to understand, it's broken, but there's a new heaven and a new earth. Remember, right? It's remade, and it's gonna be very similar. So I'm trying to dispel some myths, but what I, what I, what I want you to know about what's happening here is people are singing. He hears the, the, the roar of thunder and, and, the, and the, the roar of mighty waters. And why? Because they're singing a new song. And so, so what does this teach us? Well, first off, uh, you know, what, what's this new song thing mean? Well, they're singing a new song, only they can sing it because they're redeemed. The angels can't even sing this song because they're not redeemed. It's only the redeemed. Why? Because when they sing a new song in Scripture, in the Old Testament, in the new, when you sing a new song in Psalms, Psalms is the largest book in the Bible, as far as chapters go, right? It's the longest book in the Bible. And it's Psalms, right, that were written, a lot of them by King David. And he wrote those Psalms, and when Psalms were written, a new Psalm was written in times of salvation or great victory, okay? So, so we need to understand when they sang a new song. David wrote his and they weren't all, he didn't write that necessarily to be a co corporate congregational song. He wrote it as a song to God for his personal salvation or deliverance. They were collected, and yes, they became cor corporate congregational songs, and that's great. So what does that mean for us? Well, he, he, here's what it means. Man, in today's world, you've got churches that all they do, man, is sing just, I mean, new songs, because it's a blank check, man. They sing a new song, let's sing a new song, and it's, it's all new songs. And, and, and so that's not good because they didn't sing new songs all the time, right? Because it was in, in, in victory and, and, in, and in times of, of great salvation. And so we don't need to sing new songs all the time. But then you've got churches that are over here and man, they still sing the same 40, 50 songs they've got, man. They've got this 40, 50 song list that they sung for 40, 50 years. And they hadn't varied from that list. And you go back, maybe you went to that church as a child and you go back there today and it, man, it's still the same. They still sing, same people, just, Blue hair, singing the same songs, right? Neither one of these needs to be the totality. I mean, man, these are ditches, right? Do we need to sing new songs? You bet, because God still does good, great, brings great salvation, and he brings great victory. But do we need to sing old songs? You bet, because, man, I need some anchors in my soul because songs teach theology. Here's what I know. Half of you, man, you're gonna forget 90% of what I said by the time you have your dessert for lunch. But man, you sing the songs, you learn theology through songs. So we need some anchors in our soul. And so we wanna, you know, we wanna have balance. I mean, we wanna sing a new song every now and then, but man, we wanna, we wanna sing old songs too. And that, that you know, and, and so we wanna do that. So they're singing a new song, why? Because it's the most ultimate victory, man, they're in heaven. It's the most ultimate salvation. It's the most ultimate victory. They're singing a new song. And guess what? It was loud. 
It was loud. But it's not loud necessarily in how you think. What, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, it, it wasn't the instruments that were loud. I love instruments. I mean, Travis quoted scripture this morning, you know. I mean, praise him with a shout, pray, joyful, a harp, lyre, all, all these, not, not lyres and L-I-E-L-I-A-R, right? I mean, lyre is an, an instrument. I mean, praise him with all these instruments. And, and I love instruments. If I could play an instrument, man, I'd play the drums. You know why? Because I like to beat things, right? It'd be a great instrument for me. But I can't play the radio when it comes to instruments. I mean, I don't know keys and music. I don't know all that stuff. I know when it sounds bad, just like you, but I don't know how to make it sound good. But that's okay because it's not the instruments. They're not the focus. The instruments are simply there to help us worship. What's loud? The voices. The voices are loud. Why? Because heaven is full. You see, we have this, we have this thought, I think, in our mind that heaven is just, oh, it's just got a, man, it's just got a few people in it. I mean, you know, and, and I understand why, because it says, you know, wide is the road that leads to hell and narrow is the road that leads to heaven. And later in Revelation, we're gonna have a, a, a description of heaven and, it, and it, it's got dimensions. And if you really look at those dimensions, it's not, not really large and, and the dimensions. And you're like, oh. but what we're gonna understand is that those dimensions and those heavenly, those golden streets and pearly gates, come on, do you really think heaven's got golden streets? Do you think it's got pearly gates? I mean, that's for our benefit. Do you think gold impresses God and pearl? No, that's description of God's people. The walls and dimensions are the security of God's people. The go- we'll, we'll talk about that later, but my point is we have this view that heaven's just got a few people in it, hell jam-packed, and I believe they're both jam-packed, to be quite honest. Heaven's got a lot of people, and I want you to know that because I want to encourage you to share the faith, to share your gospel, to share the, not your God, the gospel, because the gospel is what saves, and heaven is full of people. And guess what those people are? They're singing, every one of them. It's like sometimes when I go to a pastor's conference, and there are thousands of pastors there, sometimes we'll go to a conference, our staff, and there'll be eight or 10,000 pastors there together for the gospel. We went to T4G, uh, together for the gospel conference of, uh, in Louisville. And man, there's like, man, five, six, 8,000 pastors there. And man, when they sing, most of the time, it, it, they don't even have a big band. It's just like with a piano or sometimes just acapulca, you know, that's with no instruments. And, 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 and you're singing. Some of you don't even laugh because you don't even know acapulca's not the real thing. But anyway, <laughs> man, when they quit singing, and when they quit playing, it's loud. It's loud in there. Why? Because the voices are reverberating. The voices are loud. And it's like, oh, man, wouldn't it be awesome if the church would sing like this on Sunday? And I, I remind people, man, it would be. But I want you to understand that this is all pastors. 85% of this room saved. Y'all are not with me today, are you? <laughs> Most of these people are saved. They're pastors. They not only are saved, they love the Lord. And this is a room full of people who love the Lord and they're screaming. And you know what? That's not necessarily described Sunday morning, right? That doesn't describe Sunday morning because there's a lot of people in every church on Sunday morning that's not Christians. Did you know that? There's a lot of people that's not Christians every Sunday morning. And if you're not a Christian, I wouldn't sing it either, to be quite honest. Why would you declare something in song that you don't even believe? So a lot of people that are feel, uh, sitting in this, I hope there's a lot of non-Christians sitting in the seats in churches every Sunday and watching online. A lot of them are not believers, so they're not going to sing. So it's not, it, I want this to inform and, and motivate our worship. What, what's the other reason that, that people in churches don't sing? I mean, some people sing, and, you know, when Travis is, is, is up leading every Sunday, I mean, there are people who are sitting there with their arms crossed in indifference. You know that. Sometimes Travis comes in, he looks, and man, there are people that are, I mean, man, they're doing this, and then there are some people that are sitting there with their head down. And what's Travis thinking when he looks out and sees you with your head down or with your, you you know what he's thinking? He's not saying, oh, look at this person, raise their hand. They're really worshiping, and that person's got their head down. They're not worshiping at all, not at all. He's not thinking that at all because you can't tell by that. Why? Because you see, there's people that come in here every Sunday that, that just found out that their wife is having an affair on them. They're broken. Sometimes those people can sing, but sometimes they can't sing at all because they're broken. And right now, they don't need to be singing. They need you to sing over them. They need you to sing for them. And sometimes 
Every Sunday, people come in here, and they just lost a loved one. They just lost their husband or their granddaddy, and man, I mean, they want to sing, and, but man, they're just broken, and I, I, today, I just can't sing. I just need you to sing for me. Man, people come in here every day with, they lost their job, their child is rebelling, they had a miscarriage, and we know that sometimes you come in and you can't sing. We know that. That's a lot. Sometimes I can't sing, folks, when I come. Sometimes I don't sing. You know, and that sort of, I, I sort of feel sometimes, I was telling some of our staff, sometimes I sit down on the front before I go up because I love to worship with God's people, but I, sometimes I say, man, I, I don't want people to see me when I'm not singing sometimes because I'm the pastor and I want to lead by example. But I just want to come clean with you that sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't, to be quite honest with you, because it's just a very practical thing. I'm trying to save my voice because I preach for 10 or 20 minutes twice. You wish. <laughs> I, I preach twice. I try to save my voice. And sometimes I'm thinking the words. But sometimes, sometimes I just can't help it, man. I'm singing. Right? I mean, today, he's all hell King Jesus. Bro, I'm all hell King Jesus. Flap and lip and all. I don't care. <laughs> all hell King Jesus. Right, right, man, I need to sing that. But sometimes I come in, and you know what? I sing something, and when I sing something, you know what it makes me do? I sing it, and it so overwhelms me that I just have to stop singing and begin to pray and thank Jesus or, or confess something. And so I'm not singing, oh, but I'm worshiping. And we know that's true for you. Sometimes I come in and, man, I might feel, I need to go, I just need to fall and pray. That's okay. Sometimes I need to raise my hand. Here's what I'm saying is, is we don't judge your posture of whether you're worshiping or not. We trust and we want to set the environment that the Holy Spirit moves you. And sometimes, man, last week I'm sitting down and I'm, I'm, I'm right over here. And when Scott Long was preaching, I'm over here. And Tony, man, I, God just, I just wanted to go hug you. You know, I mean, this dude's worshiping, and I just got up, went over, and hugged Tony, man. He hugged me back, man. He was tears in his eyes, and there's tears in my eyes. You know, it's, it's, I, sometimes that happens, right? Because we sing to God, but we sing to each other, encouraging one another. And so we want you to understand, man, in this world, we, we're broken. We need to bring our brokenness to the Lord and sacrifice and, and sing anyway sometimes, but sometimes we know you can't sing. We just need to sing, and we're okay. We want to sing for you and over you in those times. But let me make sure you understand something. This is the hope of what we're getting here. The hope of what we're getting is that on Mount Zion with the Lamb, the 144,000, everybody's singing. Why? Because there's not one person there who found out that somebody had a bad medical report this week because there's no sickness. There's not one wife or husband having an affair on, on their spouse because there's no sin. There's not one rebellious child. There's not one financial problem. There's no stress. There's nothing because it's not broken. It's new. It's fixed. It's perfect. That's the hope that we have, folks. God's people are happy in heaven, God's people are, are, have the hope of heaven. And finally, God's people should be ho holy on earth. Let me read verses four and five, and we'll close with this. It is these, the 144,000, who have not defiled themselves with women. They've not defiled themselves with women for their virgins. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm out. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Now, again, you got to stop and go, hold on a minute. Did John just say that those 144,000 are made up? Well, I'm going to tell you, it wouldn't be 144,000 people if it's all virgins, if it's literal. Did he just say they're virgins? They're Mother Teresa here that made a vow of chastity? Is that what he said? Thank the Lord, no. Thank the Lord God created sex. God's pro-sex. Sex is beautiful in what it was intended by God to mean. This is not about sex or any defilement that sex is defiled. It's not that at all. Thank the Lord, right? It's not that at all. What is it? Well, it's symbolic. Revelation is apocalyptic. What's it a vision of? Well, in Revelation 2, sexual perversion is associated with idolatry, right? And so we also know in Revelation 
He talks about Babylon. What is Babylon? Babylon's the world system. Babylon is the culture of the world that is opposed to God. That's Babylon. When you hear of Babylon, it is the world system opposed to God. And you hear of the church, that's God's people. What's Babylon called in Scripture, in Revelation? The whore. What's the church called? The spotless bride of Christ. You see the two, you see the two, the whore and the, the spotless bride of Christ? Sexual perversion, it, 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 sexual perversion and idolatry, spiritual adultery, we know. So what's he talking about? This whole thing is a reference. And it says those who are in heaven are those who have not gotten in bed with the whore of Babylon. Those who are in heaven are those who do not live in spiritual adultery. Uh, that, that's, that's who is in heaven. So what is he saying? He's saying, who are those in heaven? Those who are set apart to be holy. So here's what that means. Who's in heaven? All the redeemed. So what does that mean? Let let me deduce it down to what I'm meaning here. All those who are in heaven are those who are people of God and the people of God are set apart to be holy on this planet. God didn't just save you to go to heaven when you die. That's a great benefit. Praise the Lord. I'll be in heaven where I'm, I have the hope and where I'm going to be happy and I'm not going to be sick. And man, you're not going to be sick and we're not going to have stress. But it, it's not just about heaven one day. It's about mission this day. It's about representing him in a broken world today so that many more people can be in heaven with us. It's about being holy and set apart. That's what it means to be holy, right? He says that there is no lie found in them. Now, what is he, what is he saying? It, 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 there's no lie. God's people should be marked by truth. God's people should be marked by honesty. Man, we need some honesty in our world. Let me ask you something. Is there anywhere you can get stuff going on, news from around the world, that you believe anything anymore? No. Man, it's, you don't believe anything you hear from anybody anymore. God's people should be peculiar in that nothing but truth comes out of your mouth. Who did Jesus say the Satan was? A liar and what? The father of lies. So any lie, and there's no such thing as a big lie and well, a little white lie. Any lie is from the character and represents the character of whom? The dragon, Satan. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He is the truth. No deceit was found in his mouth. So we as believers, and what did it say? They followed the lamb everywhere he went. That's basic discipleship at its core. That's what it means to be a Christian. We follow the lamb. We follow the lamb in how we speak, in honesty. We're people of character. We're people of integrity. We do what we say we're gonna do. We we, we speak honestly, right? We don't just speak the truth. We speak about the truth. Jesus is the truth. So just speaking the truth means sharing the gospel with people. That's what we do as believers. We've got the antidote. We've got the antidote for what's killing the world, and it's sin. That's what's killing the world, and we should speak the truth. Not just be truthful, but speak the truth. And it says that we're blameless. Now, that doesn't mean that we have no sin and we're perfect. It means that we follow the way of God. So what does all this mean? Listen, who are the 144,000? Let me tell you who it's not. It's not people who prayed a prayer and even got baptized in the water, but nothing ever changed about their life. Matter of fact, you're beginning to see those people fall by the wayside, aren't you? Because you see, we live in the deep south here. We're we're in Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee is the mecca of the Bible Belt, right? You've got the buckle right here, right? Man, you talk about all the denominational headquarters, Nashville, Tennessee. Christian music industry, Nashville, Tennessee. I mean, man, we are in the buckle of the Bible Belt. In the buckle of the Bible Belt, it used to be cool to go to church. It's just what you did. Now you go to church and the world thinks you're an idiot. Those, those who oppose the Babylon, they think, man, it's not cool to go to church. So what's happened after COVID? Man, COVID came, churches shut down, and man, today, churches reopen, and guess what? It's not cool necessarily to come to church anymore. So where are all the cultural Christians? That ain't the cool thing to do anymore. Just to be quite honest, where are all those who are playing the game? It ain't cool to play anymore. Just to be quite honest. Who's in heaven? Not cultural Christians, not those who've gotten wet with baptism or not those who prayed a prayer only and nothing changed. Who's in heaven? Those who not are perfect because there's no such thing, but those who surrendered their life to 
follow the lamb everywhere he goes. Those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, that's who's in heaven. Are you holy? Are you set apart? That doesn't mean perfect. Are you holy? What does that mean? Well, at its, at, I mean, man, at the JV, basic level, what it means is, man, I go to church. I go to church. That's what it means at the JV basic level. In our world today, it's like people like, oh, I don't, you can be a Christian and not go to church. Is that technically true? Technically, man, I, I, I didn't go to church a few weeks ago because I was on vacation, <laughs> right? So yeah, that's technically true. You do not have to go to church to be a Christian. But let me tell you what's biblically true. If you are a Christian, you will go to church, okay? If you're not going to church, I'm not talking about I miss this Sunday. I miss. If you're not involved in church and you say, I don't wanna go to church, then folks, you're not a Christian. Why? Because Christians have the Holy Spirit of God living within their soul. I challenge you, you find it in Scripture if that offends you and bring it to me. You can't. You can't find it because it's not there. It's the lie of the beast. It's the lie of the false prophet telling you, I don't have to be a part of the church. You're not a Christian because the Holy Spirit lives within your heart if you're a believer and the Holy Spirit loves the bride of Christ and the Holy Spirit would compel you to be a part of the bride of Christ. Are you a believer? That's, the, that's at the JV level, folks. Do you love the word? I don't ever read the word. I mean, man, I don't know. I don't read the word. By the way, let me go back. All these people that don't go to church, you, you know what kind of excuses I hear? Well, I don't go to church because there's all kind of hypocrites down there. Well, I'm sure you're a right upstanding, you've got character and integrity if you say that. So here's what you're gonna do tomorrow if you've got a character and integrity. You're gonna walk in and tell your boss to shove this job. You know why? Because your company, no matter who you work for, is full of people who hate your company, full of people who don't like their job. They bad them out the company. But boy, they line up to get that paycheck. They're hypocrites. If you don't go to church because there's hypocrites here, don't you dare go to work tomorrow unless you're a hypocrite. You've been gone way too long. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really not, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Guess my lips are making it okay. <laughs> Gotta get in shape though. <sighs> are you listen, that's that's basic. That's basic. Church, the word. That's basic. Are you in the word? I miss a day. I miss a day every now and then. Are you in the word? I don't, I don't, I don't know. The Holy Spirit of God lives within you. He's gonna draw you to God's word because it's God's word. It's God's word. Man, are, are you in community? Listen, folks, it, are you a disciple? You're holy, you're set apart. What? Many people are so absolute, torn up, confused Christians right now because our world is in a mess. They think it's, it's, it's unsavable. It's going to hell in the handbasket and it's going quickly. I, I know, I feel that, but I'm not scared. I'm excited. I'm excited. Let me tell you why I'm excited. I'm excited because the time of playing games is over. That's why I'm preaching so hard because right now the church does not need you backing out. The church needs you leaning in. The church needs you full bore, 100% committed and leaning in. Okay, the church needs Christians that stand up, not lay down and not run. The church needs people who say, I'm in this, right? Because I'm excited, why? Because let me tell you, right now, we've got the greatest opportunity to be a peculiar people to this world than anybody has, than, I mean, we've got an incredible opportunity. Think about it, we live in a world, now think about this, that you do one thing and what happens? You're canceled, right? Forget you, you're not forgiven. What does the gospel say? Oh no, that's not what we do. The gospel says we love you and we forgive you. If you repent, there's forgiveness. Complete opposite, right? We live in a world that says, man, the world's been racist for a long time and, and now we're tired of it, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna fight racist, racism with racism. Is that stupid? I mean, man, that's not what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? Lay all that down. There's no Jew, no Greek, no male, no female. The, the, the white, black, you know, Asian, European, it doesn't matter. We lay, there's no distinction for those who are in Jesus Christ. The cross is what binds us together. We lay all that down. What a peculiar people we would be. 
Man, the world is dishonest. I mean, the world, everything you see is just lies and about narrative. What if we just tell the truth? Can you imagine if we just told them how peculiar to be? If we just love people, I mean, rather than, that's why I said Facebook. Listen, Christians, this whole Simone Biles thing, man, it's got me bothered. Why has it got me bothered? Because it is, I mean, Simone Biles, man, here's a young lady who's been through so much trauma and she backs out of the Olympics and what do people do? They start bashing this young girl on Facebook. They start bashing this young girl. Do they know this young girl? No. Do they know anything about her? No. They start bashing her. And you know who's involved in it? Christians. It's like, I'm going to share my opinion. I'm going to share it with the world. That's stupid. That's, that's what the world does. That's not what Christians do. Man, I, listen, I'm, I'm just going to say this. I, I see Christians go on. I, somebody posted on Facebook recently about all these worship stuff, and they started naming record labels. You shouldn't listen to this group. You shouldn't listen to this group. You shouldn't, you shouldn't sing these songs. You shouldn't sing these songs. And, 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 oh, because I love Jesus, and I'm a Christian, and I just, and you're going on Facebook where 90% of the people that's seeing this is lost and showing them as a Christian. You're battling other Christians? How crazy is that? Is that not crazy? Get off Facebook, man. Come on, how crazy is that? You got an issue, go and tell your pastor or something. This wasn't, thank the Lord. That wasn't a life point person. They're, they're smarter than that. Just go, go, listen, go tell your pastor though. I mean, good gravy. Quit getting on Facebook and on Twitter and trying to be big and say something because you're hiding behind a screen. Come on, Christians, quit, quit killing each other. Quit attacking each other. Let's be peculiar. Let's love each other. Let's love each other. Man, let's love each other. How about that? I'm sorry, Travis, I gotta quit because uh, I can't hardly breathe now. So come on up. Because, man, I, I know I said some hard things today and I, I'm sorry and I'm not sorry. Amy tells me all the time, Pat, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And I know sometimes, I, you know, I, I can say things sweeter with, in a different way and so I'm sorry if it's hard. But let me tell you why. Man, I'm passionate about Jesus. I'm passionate about his bride. And I'm passionate about you knowing him. And if I said something that offended you, I'm sorry that I offend you, but, it, but I want you to be offended by the gospel to the point of saying, I believe it's true. And if you don't know Jesus, here's another thing that will offend you. He's the only way to heaven. There's no other way. Today, will you surrender to him and have the hope of heaven? Because you don't have the hope of heaven without him. Will you surrender to him today and have the hope of heaven? If you are a believer. I challenge you. Listen, it's time not for you to get, get, you know, get scared and lay back. It's time for you to get bold and lean in. It's time for you to be holy. It's time for you to be committed. It's time for you to be devoted. It's time for you to lay aside everything that entangles you. It's time for you to begin to hate sin and love Jesus and be the church and love people and speak uh, with, with honesty and speak words of encouragement that build each other up and not tear each other down and be hope in a broken world. Church, let's just be the church that Jesus redeemed and established. Will you right now respond to however God leads you to respond? Lord, we love you. Thank you for your grace. God, I just thank you for, uh, God, what you have done in this church and what you're doing all over the world. And God, help us to not be distracted. Help us to not be scared. Help us to be emboldened. Help us to be real. Help us to love people. Help us to be a peculiar people. Help us to be holy now because we're gonna be happy then. And God, we have the hope of heaven that drives us to be holy on earth. God, I love you, and I pray for people to respond right now how you call us to respond in Jesus' name, amen.